All right, streaming architectures. Um, there's, there's, I want to talk about kind of how you put things together, right? So there's an integrated <coughs> architecture. This is kind of the old school way of doing things is how I call it. It means everything, all, the entire system is going to be in the listening room. So this means all your music processing, so your computer, your media player, your DAC, your network streaming thing, all that stuff is going to be in the listening room. It's probably going to be all in one box. It's possible to do that and make it very quiet and not damage kind of our delicate analog circuitry and our audio system. The problem with it is that it's really expensive to do this well. I don't know if you guys are familiar with our Render's product line, um, but kind of the middle of the range is around eight kil eight kil dollars, <laughs> eight thousand dollars, and it goes up, you know, from there if you want kind of the really good stuff. You, you can look inside these things. I mean, they've gone to absolutely heroic efforts to make a powerful PC um, produce very little EMI, very little RFI, um, no like acoustic noise, no vibrations. Um, they've made it so that it's a first class audio component, and it's its own sort of ecosystem. It has its own remote control app for your phone. It does its own networking thing. It's a very, very expensive, very nicely built piece of equipment. Um, back to my comment before about would you buy a, a cell phone for $18,000, right? I mean, there are some people this is a great product for, but it does everything in one place. Um, and to do that really, really well requires uh, a lot of money. Um, Inus is another one, Erliac is another one. Um, Vol Volumio is kind of a, uh, they've got their own kind of uh, media player, media server. Um, that is it all in one piece. So that you're, maybe some of you may be familiar with their media player software, but they actually have a kind of hardware piece that does all this stuff as well. I would argue they, they're, they're not kind of in the same level as the other, uh, these other devices, but as far as quality goes, but that's that kind of that same idea of let's just put everything in one box. If you're running JRiver with your local music library on the hard drive and you've got your PC connected to your audio system, I know a lot of people do that, that's kind of this integrated architecture. Uh, but the problem with that is, like I said, to do it really well to first class audio file standards is extremely difficult. And so you've been wondering why your integrated audio system, if you don't have an R render thing, you've been wondering why that doesn't sound as good as your turntable or your open reel deck. That's probably why. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to see if I understand though, if you're using an R render or InuAuth or R, like, mm -hmm. you can't use J River with that, right? Isn't it proprietary? They've got their own sort of yeah. ecosystem type thing. And so it will work until they get bored of doing that and go do something else or retire or whatever else. And then you've got this, you know, 60 pound doorstop basically. <laughs> um, that, you know, you can say that you have that or whatever and, uh, and you're done, right? I mean, people buy expensive things that don't last forever. A lot of people will, will spend. Thirty, forty, sixty thousand dollars on a car, and they're only going to drive it for five or ten years. So it's it's not unheard of that people will do that. But I mean, that's kind of what you're looking at in this case. But J River could also go away too. J River, yeah. All, all these you should think about all this stuff as kind of transitory. This is not going to be like your <coughs> one LP12 turntable that you're going to be you know like handing down to your grandkids or. It won't be a vintage version. It's not going to not going to be a vintage version. Yeah, but the probably. difference with J River going away is. You can probably get a replacement. Run You'll have something that's so much better. In fact, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. All right. Um, another type of streaming architecture is magic. So there's no central server. All the, you have all these little components that are all over the house, and they all talk to each other, and one can stream things to the other. And so in some cases, some of these things can act as input devices. You could connect a terminal, uh, a turntable, pardon me, or an analog source to one of these. Uh, one of these streaming devices and then have it be digitized, streamed over your home network to like another part of your house or to your patio or whatever else. These are these devices kind of all meshed together. Sonos is the one that I've used for the longest period of time. They've been doing this for like, I think since 2003. Um, they've got this stuff down pretty well. Some limitations, right? They only do 16441, so if you're a high risk person, it's kind of boring. Um, they've got a pretty nice UI as these things goes. It's, it's a little bit dated, but it's a pretty reliable thing. Denon Kios, if you're in the kind of dentist, Denon environment, um, they've got kind of a, a mesh streaming mechanism as well. Um, DTS PlayFi is getting some traction. There are a lot of manufacturers that are going the DTS PlayFi route. You can Google this. I'll provide some links in the slide. Um, that's another alternative. The problem with some of these things is that the ecosystem is a little closed, right? So either manufacturers sign on to this thing and they kind of collaborate and build these things that interrupt with each other with with <coughs> or they don't. And so as long as you buy stuff that's inside of that ecosystem, um, then you'll be in good shape, but like you'll have a hard time potentially connecting dissimilar devices to it. If you've got existing Hi-Fi gear, like a really nice stack, if it doesn't support DTS PlayFi, you can't use it. Um, so, uh, and then a lot of people like the Blue Sound, the Blue OS stuff from NAD. 
Um, it's, it's got its own ecosystem, it's got its own app. It has some kind of cross compatibility with other things. It tries to kind of be a little bit more friendly than some of the more closed systems, um, but it has some of its own limitations as a result. Um, There's a distributed uh, architecture. So um, I was, I'll just give you a tip, and you probably gathered this already. Distributed one's my personal favorite. Um, so you take the noisy bits of your computer audio system and your streaming system, and you get them the hell out of your listening room. You put them like <laughs> in an office, in a bedroom, in a closet. Tom's got a really nice uh, kind of like server room area of the house. You put it, it can make all the noise it wants to. It can have 10 fans. <laughs> it can you know, be on a UPS that makes noise. It can do, you don't care, because it's, it's someplace else in your house where it's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt anything. As you know, you know, the way that kind of RF noise works, you've got this, what is it, inverse square law or whatever, right? So for every, every time you double the distance of, uh, away from kind of a noise generating source, you get, you know, a quarter of the interference. And so putting something far away is very powerful, right? So the render solution, we're gonna have noisy things right next to things that you don't wanna be affected by noise. And so we're gonna go to heroic efforts to kind of shield and seal all that stuff off so it doesn't create a problem. And this stupid stupid architecture, you just buy a cheap, crappy thing that makes a lot of noise and you put it far away, you get the same result. So I like this one better. Um, and computer networking enables us to do that without, uh, without any harm and upstream a lot, a lot more than one. HQ Player was one of, from Signalist, was one of the first companies to, uh, to kind of get into this stuff. Uh, Logitech, with our Logitech and all of my stuff, uh, also relatively early in that. I can't remember what the company was before Logitech bought it, but, but John remembers he is. Slim devices. Slim devices. Oh, yeah, slim devices. Yeah, so they, I mean, they were kind of in this space a little bit. Um, Room, which we'll talk about, we've already touched on a little bit. Um, Flex Media Server is kind of getting into this space as well. So they have a server that's really noisy that you put someplace, and then you have all these output devices that are less noisy. Um, and then, David, before you go on that, the, does, the, does the distributed model assume that all that noise in the closet, none of it gets transmitted by the internet cable to your it does, and we'll explain why the assumption is generally accurate. Okay. Um, but that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, point to point. Um, so if you do UPnP, I've got a bubble UPnP app on my phone, so I can stream audio or video to my smart TV. Um, Apple Unconnect Player is kind of the Apple version of that thing. I did Googling so that I could find out what that was. Um, Varn is kind of a popular relatively high quality media player thing. I put it in the point to point category because I did some playing around with it. It does support UPnPs or, or DLNA so you can stream to like the, most of the people when they use audio bonnet, they kind of use it like JRIP, right? So computer, USB connected DAC straight into the thing, and I'm just playing everything locally and all kind of one set it. But they do support um, network streaming. They just do it really poorly. So <laughs> the audio quality is okay if you can get it to work, but let's suppose you have five different network attached DACs throughout your house, and I'll explain why in the world you want to do that. Um, and you want to switch from one to the other. It's really difficult with audio bonnet. And I pulled out all my, I used to have a full head of hair. This is what happened. <laughs> this is what happened when I, when, I, when I tried to use this thing. So if you, if you have hair and you don't want to lose it, don't do that. Um, and then Apple AirPlay is something that, that we can tell you about. Apple AirPlay, there's an Apple AirPlay and Apple AirPlay 2. As far as I know, both of them, like Sonos, are limited to kind of 1644 one. If you have high-res stuff, you're not going to really like that very much. This one is super powerful. This one's super awesome. Arguably, these things sound the best. Everything else you should know about because you'll hear about them. Um, but I wouldn't spend my money on them if I were you. All right, cool. How do we do on time? Right on time, kind of, sort of. All right, let's answer, answer some questions here. Uh, what's your take on the controversy over whether up sampling digital music for effects? All right, cool. Um, so I know uh, I've talked to John and some other folks. Um, Sometimes when people rip their CDs, they'll go ahead and sample them to like a higher sampling rate. Um, one thing to be aware of when you do that is that it's a lossy process. By lossy, in computer terms, I mean that you can't undo it and get back exactly what you had before. So if you take a CD or a track that you ripped from a CD, you can you upsample it to say 24182 for pants for or what take take a sampling frequency. And then later on, you want to downsample it back to, you lost your CD. So like you want to get back down to the CD format. Maybe you want to burn it to a CD so you can play it in your car. When you downsample it or decimate it back to 16441, you will not have bit for bit exact, exactly the same samples that were on the CD. It's a lossy process. And so from an archival perspective, if you care about like preserving your collection from, so that you have exactly the contents that are on the CD, um, at least from as far as the music goes, maybe some CDs have other weird stuff on them too. But if you, if you want to preserve them exactly from an archival perspective, 
Um, you, want it, you want those beat to be sampled for a sample exact, exactly identical. Now, it turns out that some DACs uh, sound better at other sampling frequencies. Um, in fact, it's pretty tough to build a DAC that sounds super duper amazing at 44.1. Um, all DACs do quite a bit of upsampling internally anyway. Um, I know that uh, the Benchmark series of DACs have all, they kind of did a whole bunch of experiments, and I, I may misquote this, but I think they determined that like 80 kilohertz was the, or maybe 110 kilohertz, some kind of weird ass sampling frequency was the best um, sampling frequency for the clock that was in, or the, the DAC chip that they were using. And so internally, they, it doesn't matter what you feed it, it's going to either upsample or downsample it to that DAC's favorite flavor um, to get the best sound. Um, and so sometimes you have to experiment with these things. Some DACs uh, that support both PCM and DSD, they like DSD better. So they, they'll do a better job. The filters inside of the DAC, the reconstruction filter can be a lot more gentle if it's at a higher sampling rate. Filters inside the DAC just work better if you feed it DSD. But most of your albums are not DSD, so what are you going to do? Um, what you do is you have this music server that's in your basement or in an office or whatever that has a bunch of fans and can do a whole bunch of computation and work really, really hard and make all the noise it wants to. And you have it upsample everything on the fly um, using really expensive, computationally expensive algorithms. So you're buying it like a fancy, powerful computer to do all this stuff. And it'll feed to the DACs in your house whatever sampling frequency that you like. Maybe you've got a DAC in your listening room that likes DSD, but you've got a DAC in the bedroom that sounds best at 2496. And you've got another DAC that's in the den that likes 24182. And so you kind of dial in what, after you experimentally determine which one sound, which sampling frequencies sound best. You configure that into the software, and so whenever they play to those targets, the, the, the server software kind of gets that playback optimization just right so that the DAC always gets its favorite format, regardless of what the source format was. Um, and that can make a little bit of a difference, and it just has to do with implementation of digital filters, and there's, we could talk a really long time about that, but it turns out that implementing a really good reconstruction filter that's so close to uh, 20 kilohertz is really, really difficult to do well, uh, so nobody even tries anymore. Uh, what component, DAC, streamer, or cables have the greatest impact on sound? Uh, I'm going to defer that one. And then we talked about the 40 years thing. So um, you should care about streaming because we don't, OK, if you're on a desert island and you weren't connected to anybody else, you could talk to other human beings, then you should totally do this. But if you live in a, in a, in a society that's interconnected both socially and from a networking perspective and everything else, you want to share ideas, you want to share music, you want to share um, appreciation, you want to share experiences, streaming, like, quadruples your ability to do all that stuff. And so that's why we do it. That's why we do it. So far.